Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. How are you doing today? I guess you're pretty excited with your album coming out tomorrow. Tomorrow, big day. People finally get to see the second half of the movie. Yeah. I, well, when we talked last time, you had already sit, been sitting quite a while uh, on the record. But how are you feeling now that it's going to be completely released? It almost doesn't feel real. You know, the we finished this record up so long ago. You know, I mean, for me personally, I finished recording in 2008, the end of 2018. And Des finished vocals in the, uh, I think it was February 2019. And that was a very long time ago. A lot has happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the last time we talked, it was, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, basically. And it, it, it was weird doing interviews back then as well, because the mood with everybody talking was just a little bit, you know, strange. But um, I guess you guys have also been playing some shows now. You've recently had a tour with Cradle of Filth. So how have you been in the recent months, basically? It's been good. It was nice to get back out on the road to prove to myself that I still like that lifestyle. Because after being home for three and a half years, I mean, first of all, like since I was 23 years old, I've basically spent almost six to nine months out of every year on tour. So, and I knew I liked it. And I, I never got to the point where I stopped liking that, that lifestyle. But after being home for so many years, uh, getting engaged, being able to go surfing whenever I want, sleep in my own bed every night, um, you know, getting a dog kind of just, you know, normal people stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I didn't know if I was going to like it anymore, you know, because how am I going to be all, you know, how am I going to feel about putting all those things on hold from time to time? And the second I got on the bus and I laid down in my bunk, it was a nice bus. We got, <laughs> I had a, I had a real cozy bunk on this one. Sometimes the mattresses <laughs> can really suck, but this one was real cozy. And as soon as my face hit the pillow, I was just, you know, in my little coffin, yeah, <laughs> just like oh, this feels amazing. I'm so happy to be back in here. We hadn't even played a show yet. Yeah, and I did always tell people, you know, my friends and family back here, like you know, if they ask me uh, if I miss touring, and I'm like, I think so. I know I miss the moldy smell of the venues. Like that, <laughs> after after everything, you know, I miss the camaraderie with the guys, just hanging out on tour, going to get coffee, and just hanging out like you're in high school because you don't get to do that when you're an adult you know it just mm. kind of goes away but one of the things i honestly missed was like walking into a, me a venue and just sm smelling that shit mold smell <laughs> it doesn't really bother me but you know just that's what a lot of venues that's what they smell like and <laughs> uh, it was weird that i missed that yeah well i guess it's it's um a lot of memories are also connected to, to scent. So you might, you know, step into a venue and get a certain memory attached to, to smelling molds, yeah. I guess, or sweat. I'm usually more <laughs> relaxed on tour as well. Yeah. When I'm at home, I, um, I have to I have a tendency to be a little bit more, uh, well, just less relaxed, you know? Yeah. You're on Do a pretty you... hard, hard schedule when you're on tour. So you know what to expect. Yeah. And it's, uh, I just like being around my friends. Mm -hmm. that's honestly the best part of touring for me yeah do you easily get bored at home because that's something at least i went through like without any shows to go to or a no, lot of things right? i <laughs> i am never bored like, I, <laughs> I have my little playground right here you know in my house and as long as i have my studio and you know i live about three miles from the beach and so i get to surf a lot and as long as i have those two things i'm good yeah, I'm, well, that I'm, sounds I'm nice. I'm never bored. There's always something breaking on my house that I have to fix. <laughs> it, it's just, uh, it never ends. Yeah, um, makes I'm, sense. I wish I had more time. Anyway, you guys also released what I guess is the last single of this record, This Relationship Broken, today. Um, is there anything you can tell fans about how the writing process behind that song went? Or do you have any specific memories connected to that song? Yeah, it's a song that was mostly written by Neil. 
when he was in the band and Neil, you know, he would write what we kind of called skeletons. You know, there were songs that were, could be finished, but also were open to a lot of interpretation where, and I actually kind of adapted that style of uh, writing songs these days, because when I would write, I would spend like a good week on it, you know, and doing a lot of revisions, yeah. you know, record it, mix it down. After I program drums to it, maybe bass, throw it on my phone, listen to my car, edit in my mind. It would make those edits and then just repeat. And this process just goes on for weeks, for months. And I would grow in it a, a little bit too attached to the specifics of the song. Whereas if you write a skeleton, I think you're a little less attached to the song and a little bit more open to other people's ideas when yeah. you present it to the other members of the band. Yeah. And so Neil had this Dropbox full of, I think probably like 30 different songs. Um, and I just kind of went through and, you know, listened to them all in iTunes and I would rate them one to five stars. And I mean, I liked them all, but I, you know, it's just, this was the, the ranking was more about which ones I wanted to work on first. Mm -hmm. And, um, that wasn't the first song I wanted to work on of his as a band, but I believe it was like the second or third. Now, the first part of dealing with demons was also, I guess, considered as one of your best albums to date, according to many media globally. Um, so what do you personally feel the second part adds to do that? You know, like I said, it's the second half of the movie. You know, we when we recorded this, we didn't know what songs were going to go on what album. You know, we just we were like, okay, well, here's the 20 to 25 songs that we have and let's, you know, figure out which ones we're going to do and get them recorded. And then once we're done, we'll figure out what, what goes where. So that's the best way I could describe it. You know, it's mm. sonically, it's the same. It's yeah. just the second half of the movie. And, you know, there's, there's one more song that's uh, called malicious creatures that's not going to be on this record I and mean, to tell you the truth i'm not sure why i think we're going to save it for like a bonus release or something mm. like that so you're getting nine more oh and, <laughs> and rather than 10 more on this one okay. but uh yeah it's uh we kind of left everybody hanging and now we can give some people the uh the release yeah, well, we like I know from previous uh, record that the songs were written together. You mentioned they're recorded together as well. Were they also produced at the same time or was that done separately? No, it was all done at the same time. We uh, we wrote, went into pre-pro with Steve Evans. Then we went directly into his studio, recorded everything, took a little time off for Christmas that year. Des finished all the vocals in February of 2019, mixed, mastered, and well, mixed. And then we're like, all right, so what's the order going to be? And then uh, handed things off to our mastering engineer, and it's been done ever since. And I would say that was probably April, May of 2019. So give you an idea of yeah. how old the songs can, can seem to the to the writers. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're already sort of moving on to to different things yourself, maybe than than releasing this record. But yeah, we've started writing for another record already. I mean, yeah. we're in the just in the baby phases, but yeah, it, it, it started. Well, you also mentioned the order that that's something you also decided on, and uh, I actually really liked how this album opened with "I Have No Pity" because it's it's like. It's like straight to business a little bit. But I was wondering, did you decide that, you know, with deciding that the two albums are separate entities or is it do fans have to listen first to the first half and then continue to the second half immediately? Because I feel there's like a nice flow there as well. If you listen to them in combination, it's it's like use your illusion one and two. You know, you, the funny thing is that you bring that up. I owned Use Your Illusion 2 by Guns N' Roses when I was a kid, long before I got Use Your Illusion 1. 
And I don't know why I did it. I think it's because my sister owned the first one. So I just I was like, I'll spend my money on something new and I'll just steal hers whenever I want. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those albums were recorded together. They kind of have the same vibe. And, you know, it's dealing with demons is literally the same thing you know Mm. it's i don't think you had it's i don't think you have to listen to one record to appreciate the other one you you can go in with with whatever you want and i think you'll uh view the rec each record the same way so what i really liked was that the the last track of the record is also surprisingly heavy for a last song um i was wondering why you decided to have such a like dark song at the end of the record all right so the order of the record got changed up on me without me knowing (laughs) <laughs> so, um, what is the ra- what is the last song on the record? I can't remember. It's this relationship broken, actually. Oh, the, oh okay, the new one. That's yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, uh, you know, like I just said, the when I started doing interviews for this record cycle, I had a different order of the songs, <laughs> and like originally the album, I thought it was going to open up with Bloodbath. Yeah. And but then they switched it to I Have No Pity, which I'm not sure if that was, you know, Des wanting to change things around. It was probably a, a combination of Des and uh, and the record label kind of they had so much time to sit with this record. Yeah. I'm sure either someone at the label or Des eventually, you know, after you know, probably playing it for a few people, getting some feedback you know, after sitting on it for so long, probably went, eh, you know, maybe we should switch things, things around a little bit. But, uh, so unfortunately I, you know, I had zero say in putting that song last. <laughs> what was your last song? Do you remember? Uh, oh. that we wrote for it? No, that you had on the, what would have been the original track list, I guess. Oh, I can tell you that right now. To be fair, it would be interesting to to hear what the original checklist is, so fans can have maybe an alternative listening experience or so. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll give away some secrets right now. Yeah. So obviously, opening up with uh, I still have the old order in my phone. I haven't gone through and revised it. So yeah, opening up with bloodbath, and actually, even then, this relationship was broken. Or sorry, this relationship broken uh, was the last song. So we didn't really change things up a lot. You know, I think we basically switched around. I have no pity and mantra and maybe switched around one other thing. And I believe everything else is pretty much the same. Yeah, that will be interesting to to listen to as well, I think. Well, yeah. Um, from the a guitar perspective, what I really liked in Mantra is that there are some subtle guitar lines in the background, and that's happening actually quite a lot in, in this record as well, maybe in your previous material as well, I don't know. But I was wondering, are those little details, is that something you add at the very end of the process, or is that something that you purposely write in there, or when, at what point? Usually it's written right away. Uh, when I'm it, when I'm working on a song, you know, Double Driver's always been about layering a lot of stuff, you know, and having a rhythm and then having some kind of catchy lead on top of it, even if it's a verse, chorus, whatever. I mean, we don't do it all the time, but we do it a lot. And if I write something and I'll basically put it on loop after I program drums to it, and I kind of have, like, I try to get the like the meat and potatoes of a song done first rhythms. Sometimes I feel like something really strikes me as cool. I'll put a lead in there on top of it and do some layers, but I try to get the meat and potatoes done and then I'll take sections, put them on loop and I'll just go through, you know, my, you know, different types of tones, effects, and just sit and noodle on my guitar and see if I can come up with something cool uh, to go on top of it. But Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And, you know, when I don't, it's just like, I'll just kind of come to the conclusion that uh, this part doesn't need anything else. Hmm. Like, it just, it stands on its own two feet, just leave it alone and move on. Yeah. So, and 
you know, I think a lot of those parts that I put on on top of the more metal sounding riffs are is kind of where my the my goth influence comes in, you know, kind of going back and listening to some stuff that I've layered on top of my yeah, I was definitely listening to a lot of Sisters of Mercy when when I wrote that. And um they have a tendency to do that a lot in goth music. At least the yeah. stuff in the nineties that I I I favor over the more modern stuff. But uh yeah, we've always liked doing stuff like that and yeah. Devil Driver's always been about layers. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny, actually, because in our previous interview, you also mentioned that you would like to maybe bring more industrial and goth elements to Devil Driver. But I guess you're already sort of doing that then after all. Yeah, it's kind of been there. Industrial. I don't know if that's ever going to work out with <laughs> Devil Driver. I think that's that, that's a little bit too much of a curveball for everybody. But uh, yeah, the goth influence is definitely there and not just for me, but from Des as well. You know, we both listen to a lot of that stuff. Now, when we talked last, you mentioned also that you you experimented a lot more in the well previous album um, because, you know, you, you have been writing so many songs that you came to a point where you just want to take the sounds a little bit further. Um, but since you wrote these songs at the same time, were there also lots of elements of that same experimentation in, in the, these specific songs or don't really remember? I, mean, I want to say as far as experimentation as much as uh, evolving and growth, because I know I don't write music like I used to. You know, I used to be very heavily in influenced by the whole Scandinavian metal scene. You know, melodic. I'll go on a limb and say, you know, some of the riffs actually sound pretty. And I've developed a style now that i've kind of noticed me you know i've been changing over the years into a uh you know employing dissonance a lot more than i used to and writing riffs that i would describe almost as ugly and you know building up more tension because of these weird notes that i put together that don't really sound pleasant but you only do it for a second and then you know go to something that sounds not so dissonant and also with dealing with demons one and two it was you know me neil and austin when we were working on the, these records you know we were we had become accustomed to one another at this point we had toured we had done trust no one we had done the outlaws record and now it was finally you know we had never written together before you know we met or since we hired them in the band and I, I didn't know what I was getting into. Luckily they turned out to be two of my best friends and two of the best writing partners I'll ever have. But, um, didn't really have to experiment because there was, there, you know, there's a recipe of writers here being me, Austin and Neil, and it's new. You know, we have mm. different different types of ingredients going into the recipe. And, you know, if they had stayed in the band and we had, had done a few more records after that, yeah, we probably I would definitely start to use the uh, the word experimenting because we would have to to kind of, you know, make mm. sure we didn't write the same record twice. Yeah. But because they were new in the band and you know i started writing trust no one on my own and they kind of came in later in the mix and then but now there was like we're writing a record from square one together and um it, hands down one of the most fun records i've ever done even though it was an insane amount of work learning on 20 songs and it took a lot of time and guitar players always spend more time in the studio than anybody else in the band because you know you you do drums, but you don't have to do any kind of layering. You know, you got to do mm. a rhythm for the left side and then you got to do a rhythm for the right side. And then you've got to do all the, you know, what we call the overdubs and the lead parts and solos and, you know, clean parts. And then if we have a clean part, we definitely have, you know, probably four or five different riffs going on top of it <laughs> sometimes. And then once that's all done, um, we got to do bass. 
you know, because Ashes never played bass on the records and we always, uh, it was just me and Neil did that ourselves. And even back in the day when, you know, before Miller left, I mean, he's back now, thank God. But before he left, I would play bass on probably, I think, all the songs that I wrote, you know, because I would let Miller focus on other things. And I was like, oh, well, dude, I already know the song and I'll just, I'll, do, you know, take care of it on bass and get it done quickly. So, uh, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of time spent in the studio, but it was so much fun. I absolutely love working with Steve Evitz. You know, he's totally professional. He gets in, we make coffee, we get to work, we take an hour lunch, get straight back to work and then repeat the next day. And that's, that's the way I like to do things. Yeah. Well, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it can be, but it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's good that you enjoy it as well well you you mentioned like getting to know 20 plus songs was also a bit of a challenge um i'm guessing that you're also planning to play both albums live maybe not all the songs but is it going to be tricky to put a set list together that could always be tricky these days now that we have so many songs but we opened up with keep away from me on the last tour, which went over fantastically. Like that song is meant to be an opener. I can't imagine playing that like halfway through the set or anything like that. I just don't think it would work as well, but it as an opening song. It sets a mood. It's very, has like a ceremonious vibe to it. And, you know, we don't, we usually come out kicking and screaming, just end of the line clouds over California. Not all who wander are lost. Like those have always been, uh, popular opening songs for us and it took a little convincing convincing on my part to get des to open up with mm. a brand new song that we had never played before you know because as a vocalist you know it's it's different than um you know having this instrument in front of you on stage you know and but you know a after the first show i think he was pretty convinced and I mean, shit, I, I admit I wasn't even 100% convinced it was going to work um, for that. But we're I think we're going to add Through the Depths on the next run and, you know, possibly one more from one of the two records. Yeah. When you, when the, <clears throat> the first time you play one of the new songs, you actually check the crowd for like reactions or do you just, you know, go about your own business? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean... I, I'm definitely in my own little world up there. You know, I got my, a lot of people don't like playing with in-ear monitors because they feel too isolated from their band members, from the stage and from the crowd, um, which is what the way we work for, you know, the first 10, 15 years of this band. And then eventually I finally went to in-ears and didn't know if I was going to like the isolation or not, but I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. You know, I've got my iPad on my rigs. So I can control my own monitors. I don't have to communicate to anybody. So <laughs> if I have to like, you know, I need more kick drum. I need more of the other guitar player. I want to turn myself up or something else down. You know, like when we have our breaks in the set, I'll go over there and I'll make my adjustments. And I was like, I'm, I'm, every time I'm so grateful that this technology exists now because trying to communicate to a monitor and engineer especially yeah. one that's not out on the road with you. You know, you ask them to do one thing and they do the complete opposite, <laughs> you know, and you're just like, fuck. <laughs> um, so I, I like to leave that up to myself. And um, so I, I don't look, I, I think I kind of ignore the crowd a little bit more than I should, <laughs> because I just like being in my own little world, my own little bubble. But uh, yeah, for sure. For, keep away from me i was definitely looking out there and kind of you know yeah <laughs> seeing how people were reacting especially since the fact that we weren't coming out swinging this time you know yeah. it's <laughs> it's more of a you know just sit there and bob your head and then just wait until the next song and then it's like oh, okay now now we'll get things going you know and you know it's <sighs> it it ties into this new idea of building things up which is something i've learned from lighting engineers where it's you go and see a show and you might not notice this as 
um, from a uh, fan's perspective, I had never thought about it before, but a lot of lighting engineers won't give them everything they've got right away. You know, they kind of starts out in a fashion where it's cool and there's a lot of shit going on, but they build it up throughout the set. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of resonated with me where I was like, you know what, we need to start doing this with our set list. Yeah. Like, there's there's absolutely no reason to um, come out kicking and screaming every single time. And yeah. And I learned that from Rammstein. You know, they, um, I'm going to, you know, my, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of this, but it's, uh, I think, Herreich Misch. They would open up with that song, which is definitely not, you know, a coming out swinging song. And I saw Nine Inch Nails open up with a song called Somewhat Damaged. That's the first song off the Fragile. And that that song alone just has this progressive vibe that slowly builds up. And it made me appreciate the song so much more. And I was it, it just makes for such a fantastic opener because it doesn't come out swinging. It kind of sets the vibe of the whole set and itself you know, just builds up through the, as the song goes on. And I was, I was like, you know, I would really like to employ this into our set because mm. it, it's, you know, I, I think it keeps people's attention, especially in a time where everyone has the shortest attention span in probably all of, you know, history to um, make sure that they're still interested by the, you know, by the time that we get toward the end. Yeah, well, it's interesting you mentioned the lighting thing because uh, since I take a lot of, like, I'm a photographer, so I do a lot of concert photography, and that's something I actually do notice, and I'm like, oh, why is it only the first three songs usually? But, yeah, yeah. anyway, um, so what else does Devil Driver have in store for 2023? Are you planning to do a Euro European time anytime soon? No Europe this year, unfortunately. We're working on another uh leg in in the states with cradle of filth that i believe is going to start in october and go into possibly november of this year and that's going to be it for 2023 uh, right. other than spending some time at home and yeah <laughs> work, working on new music all right well that's that's nice as well um cool well that's it for my questions so thank you so much for your time do you have any last thoughts you want to share with your fans may 12th is the day Finally get the second half of the movie dealing with Demons 2. Vol volume 2 is coming out. 